So I, I work in the Learning Emotional Assessment Program at Mass General Hospital, and we are based in the Department of Psychiatry, um, but we're really a neuropsychological assessment clinic. Um, and uh, so what that means is that we do assessments of kids that present with a wide variety of concerns. So we sometimes get folks that come in through uh, a treating clinician, like a psychiatrist, but sometimes it's from a pediatrician or a concerned parent or from schools. Um, and one of the things that I love about my job is I, I, you know, I, if I have a patient that day, I don't know what kind of uh, great kid I'm going to get to work with. And it's one of the most exciting things is to work with kids that um, present with a lot of different concerns and a lot of different strengths. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that strikes me, I work with probably a third of the patients I see are some, somewhere on the spectrum, um, Aspies or um, folks that uh, are on the lower end of the spectrum. And uh, so we've got a whole range of folks that we see with different challenges. But one thing that I always sort of um, that has always stuck with me is uh, the saying that, you know, if you see one child that has an autism spectrum disorder, you've met one child with an autism spectrum disorder. Is the great diversity is really part of what's so powerful um, for me about working with, with this group of, of kids and young adults. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our clinic just first as a, a little background. Um, one of the things that um, we try to do is take a little bit of a different approach to neuropsychological assessment than um, maybe has been historically used. Um, neuropsychologists used to actually be in departments of neurology and um, you know someone would come in and maybe they've had sort of a lesion in their brain or some sort of a medical issue and it was the neuropsychologist's job to figure out where where that was. Was it on, on the right side of the brain, the left side, the front? Um, where was it? Um, you know, we have great things now like uh, MRIs and imaging, so um, we're almost out of a job in that regard. Um, but one of the things that we do really well is to look at areas of functioning and measure them. And, um, you know, it sounds very technical, but uh, one of our goals in our clinic is to look at areas of functioning, connect that to what a child or a young adult is doing in real life. All right, and so if we can do that, we get a really good sense of what areas are going well, what areas are challenging, um, and so part of our clinic is to look at that in cognition, how folks think, and the ways that they learn, but we also do that by measuring how things are going for them socially, how things are going with their adaptive living skills, all areas of functioning. And so if you look on the first page there, there's sort of a, a graphic there that I think is really a model of what we use when we do neuropsychological assessments like this is, you know, right in the middle is the youth. And so we are looking at, you know, how are they doing with their emotional functioning? Are we seeing um, well-being? Are we seeing sadness or irritability or anxiety? Um, how are they doing with their thinking and learning? You know, are they a visual learner, a verbal learner? How's their attention? But beyond that, we're looking at how are things going in their family? Um, are the parents feeling great about things or are they getting ready to pull their hair out because things are really uh, very rough at home for this, this adolescent or young adult? Um, we look at how things are going with peers. Um, and we do that through questionnaires and rating scales, and we also spend time doing that as part of the interview. And then we look at school and community. And so it's a little bit different than what you might think of as typical neuropsychological testing. So turning to the second page, I just want to give you a little background um, on just the basics of neuropsych testing. Um, so it raised, I'm curious to know how many folks have had um, contact, either reading a neuropsychological assessment or had a family member or um, a person that they're working with have a neuropsych assessment. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Have a good afternoon. I will. No, just kidding. Um, so uh, I just want to give a few basics here. You know, what, what we do as part of this testing process is, I mean, I list there that tests are standardized and normed. And what that means is um, that there's standard procedures for when we at, test a child's or a young adult's memory. Um, there's the standard procedure that we do that through different tests. And it's normed in that that instrument, in that standardized way, has been given to hundreds or thousands of individuals that age, and we look at where you know that individual compares to that. Um, we also look across different domains. So we're not just looking at memory. We look at attention or um, visual spatial skills or um, things like uh, verbal abilities. And we are able to get a pattern or a profile of, of strengths and weaknesses with that. 
Um, we use different methods too. So you know, we don't just test this in a one-day assessment. We also talk to the parent about what are you seeing at home or talk to uh, a spouse or someone that can kind of talk about and tell us even on standardized rating skills where they rate these difficulties. So we measure it in different ways. And so it gives us a much more reliable picture of what we're seeing. Um, and then the, the thing that I always sort of emphasize here is that we talk about testing and I think sometimes people get really grounded in the numbers. And, and you know, the numbers are part of the beauty of it and it's, it's, it, it really gives us an objective objectivity, but that's not what makes diagnoses. And so if you're ever getting a neuropsych assessment, what you really want is to be able to trust the clinician that you're working with, um, to know that they're able to integrate all that together and have the training to put it together to come up with the right conclusions. So, And then the final end result, we can do all of this, this, this great assessment, but if it doesn't lead to meaningful recommendations about where to go from here, uh, it's, it's not helpful. So that's a big focus for us. So I list there on that same page as sort of the typical kinds of tests that we give as part of a battery. And you can see that um, it looks at all aspects of thinking and learning. So intelligence, when we say that, we're really talking about reasoning abilities. And, and it's really not one number. I think people think about IQ as just this big, broad number. But an intelligence test actually has a lot of different kinds of tasks and things that we're looking at. And that can tell us really important information. Um, but we also look at attention, or those group of skills called executive functions, which are really, I like to remember the kind of thing that a secretary does for an executive. That's really what those skills are all about, organization, planning, thinking flexibly, or knowing when to do what. Um, language, we look at memory. And then you'll see below that, we also, one of the things that we focus a lot on for young adults is academic skills because that can be a, a big barrier if reading comprehension is an issue or if mathematics is, is, is an area of difficulty. It's important to identify that and remediate it. Um, and then we use questionnaires that we give to parents and teachers to look at sort of how things are going socially, emotionally, um, in terms of adaptive skills. And as part of our program, we also do have some school consultation where we go do school observations or um, attend school special education meetings, IEP meetings to help out with that process as well. All right. So uh, you can see on the next page, I just sort of gave numbers in terms of what we're, what we're typically seeing as part of our program. Um, the folks that come through the door, you can see we see a lot of folks that come through with a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, but our second most common diagnosis for folks that come through is and somewhere on the autism spectrum. Um, and that's a diverse range of kids, but it's really a lot of the folks that come in for neuropsych testing. Um, and I think that diversity is maybe part of the reason that it's a really valuable tool with folks on the spectrum is because, you know, th there is so much diversity. Just having an autism spectrum diagnosis doesn't really tell us that much um, about what a kid's strengths and weaknesses are. It gives us some information, but it's more important to look, well, what does this individual on the spectrum, what are they struggling with, what, what are their strengths? Um, and you can see one of the points I wanted to make just, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some examples and, and uh, a few cases just to kind of talk a little bit about how we've worked with folks, but um, it, we need to think beyond that diagnosis and you can see that we, uh, on this chart here we're talking about autism spectrum disorders and co-occurring concerns. So in our clinic what we're seeing, we see folks that, that come in with this diagnosis, 63% of them, if we give them questionnaires or we give parent questionnaires, are also struggling with anxiety, all right? 49% are also dealing with some issues with their mood, either irritability or sadness, and that may not be a diagnosable thing, but it's at a level that it's causing problems for them. Um, behavioral issues in 27%, whether it's outbursts that are really rare but causing significant problems or just um, d disruptive behaviors and getting overwhelmed at home. Um, family stress is happening in 20% of the families that we see where there's a, an individual on the spectrum. 71% struggle with adaptive skills. These are like daily living skills, like um, hygiene or um, taking care of chores at home, things like that. Um, so that tells us we need to do more than just say, you know, this is an autism spectrum disorder. All right. um, so we can answer some really important questions, and I think that's what I want to sort of talk about. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about two cases that, um, two folks that I saw, um, young adults transitioning from high school, end of high school to, to college age. Um, so we, what we're able to answer with testing is one, what are an individual's strengths and weaknesses? 
So what are areas that look great? Fantastic vocabulary, um, but you know, longer reading comprehension is tough or slow for this individual. Um, it, it, great factual knowledge, but when information gets more complex, gets easily overwhelmed and being able to organize that. So those are the kinds of things that we can point out and help us to understand what's this person gonna need in a classroom or in uh, any follow-up sorts of uh, services that they get. We also are able to track progress. So um, I usually I get a chance to see folks back a year or two later and say we've done recommendations, we've, we've, we've been able to put interventions in place, and what kind of progress are we seeing with that? So that's a really valuable thing. And um, sometimes it looks great, sometimes it doesn't. And at that point we have to say, you know, what is this young adult not getting in their school program? Or what are they not getting out of this early career vocational training that they're getting? Um, we're not seeing progress in a given area. Um, we're also able to identify, you know, if there's co-occurring depression or anxiety, um, that's something that needs to be identified and treated, right? Because no one's uh, immune to that, regardless of if you have an autism spectrum diagnosis or not. Those can happen to anybody. And uh, for a lot of folks that we see, if that's going on, it can be a key barrier. Um, and it's not always as evident in folks on the spectrum because it's, it's a little harder to convey those things sometimes because of social challenges or um, vocabulary around emotions. It can be difficult to identify that sometimes for folks, even for themselves. Um, so uh, we also talk about what supports are needed to succeed so we're able to t tie that to specific recommendations, whether it's accommodations in a classroom setting like extended time. Um, accommodations of an alternate setting for testing, um, opportunity for additional tutoring, knowing that there's difficulties in math there and that that's going to be particularly challenging, exemption from language-based classes like um, a foreign language, um, or if it's increased social support for, from a counselor as they transition to a different setting such as school. So that's really what we do is take all of that and then make really specific recommendations. Um, so that's kind of the last one too, what treatments and support are needed. So I want to talk about two individuals um, that I saw relatively recently for evaluations. And um, first one I'm going to talk about is Jack. Um, so Jack was an 11th grade student um, at a really academically rigorous uh, local high school in, in Massachusetts. And uh, had really done incredibly well academically. I mean, this is a star student, one of, one of those individuals that teachers are just sort of in awe of in terms of what he knows and what he's able to figure out, clearly headed for incredible things. Um, early on in adolescence, he had gotten a diagnosis of ADHD and had, had struggled with organization and managing things, and so had that diagnosis already and had taken some medication for that in the past. Wasn't taking medication currently, but, um, but what had happened is he was becoming increasingly overwhelmed at school. And really in the last year, there had been several you know, tremendous meltdowns at school in which he ended up in you know, a, a supervisor, a principal, a vice principal's office, and really like, got so overwhelmed he trashed the office and was throwing things. And this is, was really not like Jack. Not the, not, he's not a defiant kid. Um, and most of the times these were triggered by a pileup of uh, demands. He was involved in a lot of extracurricular activities, school plays, and, um, it, and there just seemed to be this time, these times where he, he would, things would burst and he just couldn't control things. Um, so that was the referral question, really. Um, and, but then we talk, I talked with the parents and there had been sort of longstanding social challenges. You know, um, and so this is an 11th grader coming in for an evaluation. We did all of the cognitive testing. We spoke with the parents. We took a really detailed history. Um, we had question, him fill out questionnaires. The parents fill out questionnaires. And this was a, a exceptionally eloquent and bright young man um, who was a pleasure to work with. When we put everything together, he really had undiagnosed Asperger's disorder. And he was so smart that he had really been able to compensate throughout much of early development. But talking with the parents, um, you know, those bells that started to go off in terms of things that we often see individuals struggling with that are on the spectrum. So, you know, the mom recalled a conversation she had had several years ago where he just said, Mom, can you just give me like 10 ways to start a conversation? Like, if you could just like make a list, and, and the mom recalled her sitting down and asking her to make a, a list of ways that you could start a conversation. 
Um, and, and that was just an example of, a, a, you know, a hundred little stories like that there that were long-standing social struggles that he had managed to work around by using his intelligence, using his factual knowledge, using his ability to, to figure out the situation logically. And that's what the mom said, he's so logical. Um, he loved Legos growing up. In fact, at one point he had built that's my time, my goodness. Um, he had problems with time management, which I do. Um, so we'll do one more minute on this one, and I'll skip the last one, because this is one of my favorite patients I've ever seen. And, um, you know, he had built with Legos um, uh, 10 to 20 different models of guitar, each in a different color, um, each with different details, and had them lined up on his wall. Um, and loved to go in and talk excessively about that. I asked him about guitars, and he could tell me every type of guitar that was out there, every type of brand, every um, which type of um, motor it had, what 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 what, it, what made it run and work. Um, and he also had rituals at home and routines that had caused challenges for him. So looking through this, what we were able to do, identify is that this, this is a very bright kid who is compensated, but you know Asperger's disorder is in the picture for him. Um, and that's really one example. I was going to talk about another where, um, another case of Sarah where, you know, it had been identified but she'd never had any neuropsych testing. And what we found is her language skills were great but her nonverbal skills were weaker. All right. And so that's really when you have a neuropsych assessment, the, the, the goal is to take those pieces that are not as readily apparent and identify those and bring them into the light. And it's, it's really not about labeling as much as helping folks to have a narrative and an understanding of what's going great for this individual and what the challenges are and then connecting that to the specific resources. So if you flip to the back of your packet, you can look through and I just included the two um, evaluation summaries. The reports are about 14 to 15 pages long with really specific recommendations. But these are the types of things that we're able to glean from an evaluation. Um, so if you know someone that's struggling and they're not sure why, um, it, it's a great way to start to put that, those pieces together. We don't do everything, but we're often able to connect folks up to the services that they need that better match their profile or what they're struggling with. So I appreciate the time to talk with you guys, and sorry that I went a few minutes over. Um, thanks.